The Decemberist, part one. Russia's first revolutionaries. Let's go. 1815. Yeah. At the Battle of Waterloo, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte suffers his final defeat. And two decades of war in Europe come to an end. The victorious powers, led by Austria, Britain, Prussia, Love and it. Russia, meet at Vienna uh, to decide the fate of Europe. The frontiers of nations and empires are redrawn, while Emperor Alexander of Russia adds King of Poland to his list yeah. of titles. He <laughs> also I wonder if he's ever thought about doing like audiobooks to ensure that with his no voice. Oh yeah, the, the, narr the narrator, yeah. definitely. Imagine him yeah. doing like a, like a kid's nighttime story. <laughs> It'd be funny. Pollutions threaten <laughs> Europe's established order. Voice, the Russian oh, so Empire, good. after many great sacrifices in the wars against Napoleon, emerges more powerful than ever. But mm. not everyone in Russia is pleased with the new state of affairs. Yeah, I a mean, group your of young of army a officers looting. dream of a different future for Russia. A new form of government, radical reforms, even a Russia without a Tsar. Okay, what you got in store for us today, Epic History TV? Open your door, for I am a bogus gas man. All right, Jack. <laughs> it's autism, bro. <laughs> this video is sponsored by NordVPN. For peace of mind. In 1812, Napoleon had invaded Russia with the largest army Europe had ever seen. It Fucked was up. a defining moment in his reign. But he underestimated Russian resolve. Mm -hmm. Four months later, the remnants of his army began its infamous retreat from Moscow. Oh. The Russian the army and its coalition oh, allies then Marshall. drove. No well, what is that? What's my hero? Hmm. I don't know what that was. <laughs> Napoleon's forces I swear to fucking God, Europe, if there is a ghost, I'm making a giant <laughs> Germany, and finally arriving in the streets of Paris itself. Napoleon's abdication was a moment of triumph for Emperor Alexander and for Russia. Uh, it was. For many young Russian officers, it was also an eye opening experience. <laughs> Look at the motherfucker on the right, bro. <laughs> was an autocracy, <laughs> ruled by an emperor with no checks upon his power. Ah. There was no political opposition or constitution. There was no freedom of speech or right to trial. No, what he said Approximately 80% of Russians were serfs, peasants with no rights, freedom, or hope of betterment. Oh. Their status passed down yeah, to stuck. their children. Stuck in their, their position, The inefficiency, their class. not to mention injustice of such a system, was increasingly apparent, even to many Russian aristocrats. In Europe, serving as officers in the Russian army, they'd visited countries where serfdom had been swept aside by war and revolution, and where monarchs had granted constitutions that limited their power, protected freedoms, and acknowledged the rule of law. And they wanted the same Many for were their inspired country. and began to dream of fair. similar reforms in Russia. But few placed faith in Emperor Alexander to aid their cause. No, oh, because he was a psycho loony doing cocaine every night. Yes, I can read Russian. You always, <laughs> you always want to teach me, but I am the emperor, and I deserve this and nothing else. <sighs> oh dear. On the night of the 11th of March, 1801, Alexander's father, Emperor Paul, was strangled to death by a group of disaffected army officers. Alexander oh. succeeded to the throne, aged just 23. The ineffectiveness and chaos of his father's rule had appalled him. In right. 1797, okay. he'd written to his tutor, to speak plainly, the well-being of the state is not at all considered in the administration of affairs. Mm. There is only absolute power. But then did he fall into the same thing as his dad purposes. did? The choice of officials is entirely a matter of favoritism. Merit counts for nothing. 
the farmer is plagued, commerce is hindered, personal liberty and well-being are reduced to nothing. There you have the picture of Russia. Judge how my heart must suffer. But then you didn't change, the Alexander. Young Alexander displayed a great enthusiasm for reform, an encouraging sign to Russian aristocrats who wished to see a more modern Russian state. In 1803, he passed a decree that gave landowners the right to free their serfs. Many hoped it was a first step towards the abolition of serfdom. In 1808, the brilliant and liberal-minded Mikhail Speransky became Alexander's chief advisor. He created a new council of state to advise the emperor, and even began working on a Russian constitution. But in 1812, steps in progress. Alexander's appetite for reform ended abruptly. First, See? an anti-reform faction, led by the emperor's <coughs> sister, Ekaterina Pavlovna, oh. engineered Speransky's dismissal. Then, Napoleon invaded Russia. In this moment of supreme crisis, Alexander was seized by religious fervor, a sense of personal mission and national destiny. Ah, so it literally only happened The burning of Moscow, after he declared, the of had illuminated his soul. Liberal reforms, he could now see, were only the road to anarchy and chaos. They were an intolerable risk to Russia's holy institutions. Because that's what In 1850, to France. any officers returning from Europe harboring hopes of reform were to be severely disappointed. Alexander added insult to injury by granting a liberal constitution, not to Russia, but to his new kingdom, Poland. Not one, it turned out, he planned to honor. <laughs> Three years later, That's why when Alexander sign, raised the possibility of a it. Russian constitution based on this Polish experiment, it proved an empty promise. Idealistic young officers, more alienated than ever, decided that if the emperor would not take up their cause, they must act themselves. They began to what organize happens? secret societies and to plan a revolution. See, people start taking matters into their own hands, don't they? You lose cameras, take them down. <laughs> we do not fear death on the battlefield, but we are afraid to speak out in favor of justice. That's a wham one. That's a wham one. Many Russian military officers already belonged to a secret society. Freemasonry had been imported from Europe in the 18th century okay. and was yeah. popular among army officers. Okay. But in 1816, officers from Russia's prestigious Guards regiments, based in St. Petersburg, formed a new secret society, the Union of Salvation. Four of its founding members would play a leading role in a revolutionary movement that became known as the Decemberists. All right, nice little Nikita backstory. Mrazov, Let's get into it. A captain in the Guards Division staff, aged 31 at the time of the Decemberists' revolt. He would draft one of their major plans for constitutional reform. Lieutenant Colonel Sergei Muravyov Apostol, aged 30 oh, like, at the time of the revolt. Face was weird. Yeah, that's what I just thought. That's weird, he's moving. In Ukraine. Colonel Prince Sergei Trubitskoy, aged 36 at the time of the revolt. A war hero from one of Russia's most distinguished families, Trubitskoy would be chosen to lead the Decemberist coup in St. Petersburg. That was the old and Colonel cat Pavel uh, Kastel right? of the Vyatka Infantry Regiment, aged 33 at the time of the revolt. Also a decorated war hero, badly wounded at Borodino. He was a brilliant, if uncompromising, officer and one of the most active and radical members of the Union. Mm. He would argue for the Emperor's death and creation of a Russian Republic. Very the extreme. Union of Salvation <laughs> soon merged with another secret society, the Order of Russian Knights, to form the Union of Prosperity, with more than 200 members. Its charter, known as the Green Book, set out how the Union was to be organized. It also spelled out its commitment to educating the public about enlightenment ideals of virtuous moral citizenship. This, it okay. was hoped, would generate wider support for reform among Russia's elite. Only a trusted inner circle was privy to the Union's more radical, long-term goals of securing a constitution 
and ending serfdom. Okay. Yeah. I'm kind of with it. Quite yeah, I'm with it. Be easy. <clears throat> Why are the Russian people and the Russian army unhappy? Because the Tsars have stolen their freedom. The leaders of the Union of Prosperity were wise to be wary. Alexander yeah, had tightened censorship laws, while allies kept him informed about Russia's supposedly secret societies. <laughs> he knew the For whole the time. moment, he tolerated them, telling one courtier, You who have served me since the beginning of my reign know that I have shared and encouraged all these dreams and delusions. It is not for me to be strict. His new closest okay. advisor, General Alexei Arakchev, felt no such restraint. Arakchev had masterminded the organization of Russian artillery during the Napoleonic Wars, and was famed for ruthless efficiency, a violent temper, and absolute loyalty to the Emperor. He so loathed almost Alexander's anything to do with Western man. Europe. You don't get things done by talking softly in French, he once remarked. <laughs> I like this guy. I like this guy. You don't get anything done speaking softly in French. He put in charge of the Emperor's latest idea, the so-called military settlements. Okay. The plan was to cut the cost of Russia's huge army by having soldiers and serfs live side by side in new villages organized like military camps right. with strict discipline. Hmm. It was a harsh policy, even by the standards of Russian autocracy and led to misery, riots, and rising resentment against the regime. So you just build fucking digging the deep Arakchev hole for also enforced strict new standards of discipline and conduct in the army. The soldiers who had defeated Napoleon were now subjected to endless parades and inspections. Small infractions were brutally punished. <laughs> piss Jack off. Officers who spoke out on behalf of them I've just spent so many years of my life fighting against Napoleon and his bullshit army of the French. And now you're telling me I need to do drills and marches. Go wipe my backside with your fleur, your fucking feathery hat. Absolute inconsiderate asshole. Men were dismissed. In 1820, a protest by yeah, the Semyonovsky Lifeguard Regiment one of the army's senior units okay. led to even more savage punishments. To the Decembrist leaders, it proved that even elite regiments had fallen out of love mm. with the regime. That is, yeah. Mm -hmm. They themselves would be acting in a strong Russian tradition of palace coups led by army officers oh. to secure dynastic and political change. That's oh. a child. The crucial child. task was to be ready when the moment came. Yeah, it was a child, they murdered him. Fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many times have we said it? When you're royalty, you are never safe. Yeah, poor pets are kids. <laughs> Do not, in a video game, 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 it's in a video game. <laughs> the Russian people, free and independent, is not and cannot be the property of any person or any family. <laughs> what are you saying, cuz? Understand we're free! <laughs> By 1821, the number of new members joining the Union of Prosperity made its founders suspicious of infiltration okay. and discovery. So they dissolved the Union. Its most trusted and committed members formed two new groups, each with around 20 to 30 members. The Northern Society was based mm, in the Russian capital, in St. Petersburg, the and was initially the more moderate organization. The traveling. more radical Southern Society was based in Tolchin, oh, Ukraine, I'm where several Decembrist that. officers were stationed <laughs> with their regiments. Both societies spent their time holding secret meetings at the apartments of their members. They would stay up late into the night discussing political ideas, reading aloud from banned literature, drafting manifestos and resolutions. And drinking a fuck ton of beer. The Northern oh, Society adopted the draft faced. constitution by Nikita Muravyov as its aims. His moderate document would make Russia a constitutional monarchy, but was otherwise heavily influenced by the US Constitution of 1787. Okay. All right. He too here. called for a division of power 
between executive, legislature and judiciary, with each imposing checks and balances on the others. The executive was the emperor, supreme official of the Russian government, who would command the armed forces, lead foreign policy and had the power to veto legislation. Mm -hmm. The legislature, okay. a people's vietje or assembly, composed of a supreme duma or senate, and a house of representatives. Serfdom would be abolished <clears throat> and there would be equality before the law. The right to vote would be restricted to those who owned a certain amount of property, thus excluding the very poorest Russians. <laughs> the Russian Empire was also to become a federal state of 15 regions, each with their own executives and assemblies. Okay, yeah, that's a lot. <clears throat> Well, no, However, uh, in 1823, a new member yeah, would true. take the Northern society in a much more radical direction. Year old Kondraty Relief was another war veteran and a famous poet. He was passionate, eloquent, and devoted to the cause of revolution. He was known for his satire of the hated General Arakchev, secretly circulating amongst Russian liberals. Okay. All fear, tyrant, for evil and treachery. Thou shalt be condemned by thy posterity. Kind of got that one. Despised <laughs> in all its forms. It's really there are no good governments in the world, well, except in America, he declared. He proved a highly influential figure, and soon a radical wing of the Northern society formed around him, taking up his argument for a republican revolution. Uh, a friend a described sway, a meeting though. at his apartment around this time. There must have been more than a dozen people in the room, but at first I could not distinguish anything because of the dense blue haze of pipe and cigar smoke. They were sprawling on sofas and on the deep window sills. Young Alexander Odoyevsky and Bestuzhev sat cross-legged, Turkish fashion, on a Persian carpet. Okay. An intense youth with a pale complexion and prominent forehead lifts a glass. <laughs> Death to the Tsar! <laughs> the toast is received with emotion. Reliev's jet black eyes light up with an inner flame. They sing to the death of the Tsar. The rhythmic chant flows through the open windows for all to hear. Oh no. Not so secret! Game. You're not. Who's going to say something to the Tsar? The government belongs to the people and was established for the good of the people. The people do not exist for the good of the government. Big up! We do not. <laughs> the leading figure of the Southern Society, based in Ukraine, in a video game. was Colonel. Pavel no, no, Pester. that one was fine. All right, sweet. He that provided the group with its own constitution, <laughs> Ruskaya Pravda. <laughs> Russian truth. This lengthy, unfinished treatise was much more radical than Muravyov's constitution. There was no place for an emperor in Pestel's new Russia. Oh, he wanted to make The big, former big supreme changes. power has already sufficiently proved its hostile feelings towards the Russian people. Mm. The current order will cease to exist. Mm. Bestel called for a revolution, spearheaded by a provisional Supreme Council that would implement gradual but sweeping change. Okay. The two main needs for Russia are clear. A complete reorganization of the state order and structure, and the publication of a completely new code of laws, while preserving everything that is useful and destroying everything that is harmful. That's so blanket. Serfdom would be abolished so broad. and redistributed yeah. to the peasants class privileges abolished, and the vote given to all Russian male citizens. Okay. The northern and southern societies remained in close contact, despite major differences of opinion between and within both societies. Hmm. There was still much that bound the them. Of all desired the abolition of serfdom and conscription, the end of autocratic government, the establishment of new rights and freedoms for the Russian people. Nah, it's just not going to go well. What's more, they felt themselves to be in step with a spirit of the age, as revolutions and conspiracies spread across Europe in the name of liberty. Such events reaffirmed their conviction that change in Russia must come from direct action. A coup d'etat, or revolution. 
It was brewing, weren't it, Jack? Yeah. It was brewing. On the 14th, I will be Emperor or Dead, Grand Duke Nicholas, 12th of December, 1825. Okay, then. In 1825, Pavel Pestel learned that the following spring, Emperor Alexander and his entourage would travel to Ukraine to inspect troops of the Second Army. Pestel formed a plan to assassinate the Emperor and mm. launch a coup to establish a Russian Republic. Mm. The date was set, the 12th of March, 1826. There you go. After urgent communications with the Northern Society, Brilyev's faction agreed to launch a simultaneous uprising in the capital, St. Petersburg. I thought it was but in capital. December, unexpected news threw all their plans into disarray. That winter, Emperor Alexander visited southern Russia, where it was hoped the climate would improve his wife's frail health. Instead, Alexander himself became seriously ill. Oh, He died at Taganrog, aged 47. I didn't even need to Typhus assassinate him. was the most likely cause. I didn't even need to do it. No. Alexander's sudden death was a shock to all Russia. That's a problem for the him. The Decembrists had agreed that the best time to force political change was at the succession of a new Tsar. Now was their moment. But no one was quite sure who the That's new it. Tsar was. Oh, fucking hell. Alexander had died without legitimate offspring. By the law of succession, he should have been succeeded by the eldest of his younger brothers, Grand Duke Constantine. But Constantine was terrified at the prospect of becoming emperor. <laughs> I will be strangled, just as my father was strangled, he would say when the subject came up. Yeah, okay, So three fair. years before his death, Alexander signed a secret document making his younger brother, Grand Duke Nicholas, his heir. Okay. But when Alexander suddenly died, the new order of succession was still secret, known only to a few members of the imperial family. Okay. All of Russia assumed Constantine was their new emperor. Patriarchs, politicians and troops swore new oaths of loyalty. Even Grand Duke Nicholas swore an oath, judging it better to observe the usual customs until Alexander's secret document could be made public. Okay. All right. But Constantine, well, the based there? in Warsaw, in his role as commander-in-chief of the Polish army, had no intention of taking the throne. Nicholas urged his brother to come to St. Petersburg and publicly renounce the throne to end the confusion. Constantine refused. I cannot accept your request to come to St. Petersburg and warn you that I shall move even further away unless everything is settled in accordance with the will of our late sovereign. <laughs> My man is petrified of getting killed or assassinated. He doesn't want to go out this country later. He's like, no, I'm not having none of it, brother. I'm going there to announce it. I got no shit. Fuck this. No, he's not even going. I'm not risking to yeah, announce it. I'm not like, going on the like, 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 fucking bring out the letter, say that I'm not it, and then I'll think about coming. Or, or maybe you'll come down from St. Petersburg. Come down to me. Yeah, that's it. Like, bring that letter as well, innit? Like. While the Decembrists in St. Petersburg were meeting daily, they had been caught off guard by Alexander's death. Yeah, from a big the spanner chaos in the of works. the interregnum provides perfect cover for them. Mm. They recruit more officers to their cause, sound out the rank and file, work out who can be relied on and who cannot. Okay. Reliev works without pause. All, right. All are fired with a wild enthusiasm. That December, rumors, confusion and fake news swirl around the Russian capital. Grand Duke Nicholas what knows he is not they? popular with the troops. Like massive they massive public fires him as a yeah. they look sick. overly they look fond sick. of inspections and parades. Now he is told that unknown army officers are actively conspiring against him. He decides to act first. What's he gonna In do? In the early hours of the 14th of December, 1825, Nicholas declares himself Emperor of Russia. <laughs> How does that go down? He will require an oath of loyalty that morning from all officials and troops in St. Petersburg. Do they give it? Probably not. The Decembrists not. know that if the troops swear that oath, 
their cause is lost. Oh. There might not be another opportunity like this in decades. Oh, what are they going to do? December becomes do or die for the revolutionaries. And before the day is out, the streets of the Russian capital will run with mm. blood. Oh. He's going to leave it until next episode, though, isn't he? Of he fucking You is. fucking cunt! You cheeky yeah. bastard! <laughs> <laughs> does it all the time. Oh. All the time, mate. So, so good. What another That's brilliant very reaction. Good. Very, very good. Glad that we're back on some Epic History TV's oh, content. Missed your voice, bro. Missed, missed it. Missed your voice. Oh. Always good, always far and always informative. We love that reaction. If you haven't already, head over to their page. That link's in the description box down below. Check out their content for yourself. If you enjoyed our reaction, looking forward to future reactions, you know what you need to do. You need to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and we will catch you in the next video. Bye for now, brethren.